Hey guys, Raif Darazi here, and I wanted to share with you um, a little bit about this meeting, annual meeting that we're having. And what you'll often find at conferences is what's called a poster session. And so this is an opportunity for researchers, also known as investigators, have an opportunity to share their work that they've been working on um, via a poster, as you can see. And it's like a summary of, of everything that they've been doing. Oftentimes, there's only a limited number of speakers that can speak at a conference or a meeting like this one and share their, their research. So this gives an opportunity for um, some of the other projects to also have some time to showcase their work. And what's really cool is that oftentimes, like during this poster session, the person who's been working on it will be next to their poster, available, ready to explain everything that they've been doing. If you have any questions, you can kind of like have a conversation with them, which is cool. So you get that one-on-one -on -one time as opposed to just seeing someone like on a stage talking about their uh, research. Okay, so let's go check it out. I'm gonna see if I can grab some people and like force them into um, being on camera with me. <laughs> Before we jump into the rest of the video, I wanted to quickly let you know that I'll be talking to six different people. Apologies for the relatively poor video quality. I didn't have my camera with me, my DSLR, I just had my iPhone so I was using that. And the audio isn't great either, but that's kind of virtue of the fact that we're, we were in a pretty like, loud place. If you watch the people that I'm interviewing, you can see that they are actively translating the scientific language that they're used to using into more understandable language for someone like me and this is not an easy task i'm sure it's very difficult to do on the spot for some of the investigators that i'm going to be talking to that happen to be a part of the hope collaboratory we're going to be talking about three distinct areas in the block lock stop model for reaching an hiv cure if you're unfamiliar with what this is i posted a quick video explainer um, of block lock stop which is the focus of the Hope Collaboratory. And I'll put a card up here so you can watch that too if you want a little backstory to what we're talking about in this video. It might help you understand things. This is an opportunity to actually get to talk to someone who is working on, I don't know, what you call it an experiment? What do you call this in general? Yeah, it's a, a set of experiments. I mean, this is just a method that I've been working on um, to look at a specific modification on DNA. Okay. So I would call this like a methods poster. A methods poster. Yeah, this okay. is not a full like clinical design set. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And so I'm here with Alina today and she's going to tell us a little bit about the poster that she brought here for the meeting. Hi. So I'm Alina and I'm a postdoc in Dr. Dorobi's lab. Um, and this is a method that I've been working on recently to look at a specific type of modification to DNA called DNA methylation. One of the focuses of HOPE is how epigenetics can put the virus into deep latency. Mm -hmm. um, there are two main modifications to DNA at the histone level and at, onto the DNA itself. So would that be the... the the locked part of the yes. lock, lock, stop? Yeah. Okay. So we find that in herbs, um, which is what Doug focuses on. Herbs? And would, you, would you mind um, explaining to them really quick what that is? A lot of people have never heard of it. There are endogenous retroviruses called herbs that are in our genome. Okay. Um, there are modifications to the DNA that really silences them and represses mm -hmm. them so that they're not being expressed. So they were once like genome. active viruses were active. that were having an impact on you and me, but then, I mean, in the past and then eventually just became inert basically yeah. in our in our genome and they're there but they're not really having an impact on us anymore yeah and so that's one of the methods or the potential mechanisms that we're looking at yeah um potentially to silence hiv yeah this method is called targeted enzymatic methylation sequencing for the provirus and so we wanted to capture the virus's dna methylation Mm -hmm. So methylation happens on these nucleotides called cytosines when they're next to a guanine typically. So we call those CPGs. I, w I was going to ask if you could like simplify what methylation is or what? Basically, your DNA is marked okay. by these methylation marks. Okay. And that will turn genes on or off. Okay. Yeah. So it marks the DNA, yeah. flipping it on or off. Exactly. Got it. Yeah. That's great. And so when methylation is there, it shuts it off. It shuts oh, great. Okay. So, um, and so that's part of making it endogenous. Yeah. Okay. Making it silent. Silence. In the past, a lot of the experiments that we've done to look at the role of DNA methylation for viral transcription has been done in cell lines or models um, that we grow in the lab of, of CD4 T cells or sometimes monocytic cell lines um, that have HIV integrated into 
to your name. Mm -hmm. When you have an inflammatory response, uh, you can put in, in certain cytokines on these cell lines, and then HIV will reactivate and transcribe. So we've been using this as a model for the reservoir and latency. Can you speak to what cytokines are? They're like, it basically causes an inflammatory response in your Okay, because I was going to say, I heard of that during COVID. Yeah. They talked about cytokine storms. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, like, information is good and bad, right? Yeah, So when it's balanced. When it's balanced, it's, it creates a response that will target bacteria, viruses. Yeah. Uh, too much inflammation or for inflammation for too long is detrimental to your body. Yeah. So, in the case of COVID, you have these overwhelming amounts of cytokines in your body and mm -hmm. yeah people would die from the cytokine storm. Okay. So basically what we did was we created this method to look at DNA methylation. First we started with cell lines. And so basically the we created these molecular probes that pull out the HIV DNA from the cell line DNA. Because HIV is so rare, right, in all of our cells, we have to find a way to target it and capture it. Um, and then from there, we converted it using a different enzymes, um, which is, this is pretty complicated. It's fine. Yeah. I don't need to explain this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just the okay. overview. So HIV is not prevalent in all of our cells, all in our body. Yes. It's in specific areas. Yeah. So we created these probes that look for the actual sequence of the HIV mm. virus and pull it out of the host, all of your host DNA. Mm. And then we looked at the CPG methylation across all of essentially the entire virus. So before, previous methods were very, like, were very damaging to the actual DNA itself. So when we would try and sequence the virus, you would get maybe like a little bit here, a little bit there, mm. and nothing else. Mm. So it was really hard to capture all of it across the entire virus. And to clarify, you're taking cells out and analyzing that DNA, not while it's in the body. So, yeah, so, these so you're not like cells. damaging DNA in someone's body and like going, okay. <laughs> yeah. So we took, so this is in cell lines, but then we took people's blood cells. Yeah. And then we took the DNA out of those blood cells yeah. and we did the same. Yeah. yeah. In other words, it's safe. It's safe for everyone. It's safe for you. Like, yeah. it's the same thing is just going to the doctor and get your getting your blood drawn. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Cool. This might be a little bit too in depth, but so there's like these CPG marks or methylation that. You, like this is the viral sequence. Okay. This is at the five prime LTR. So this is upstream of the virus. This is the, uh, the virus when it's resting. When you activate it with inflammatory, like an inflammatory signal, this usually turns on uh, HIV transcription. Yeah. You see that these marks go away. Mm. So this basically says that maybe there is an irregulatory role for DNA marks in this region. Mm. So these mark control markers kind of switched off. They switch off. Okay. And, and then so, you get... Oh, yeah, that's what I was going to clarify. DNA yeah. tra transcription is the process of making new RNA, RNA that goes throughout the body, finds another cell to inhabit, and starts the process all over again. So this this is specifically focused on the replication, uh, the transcription part. Yeah. Just shutting off transcription. Of Turning off transcription. Okay. Yeah. So that the little factory can, can't continue to create new RNA, which is... Like I said, the little soldiers that go out and infect other cells. Thank that was great. No, yeah, we have a great general overview of, of what's going on with some, some details. So I think that's awesome. Thank you, Alina. Appreciate it. All right, everyone. So we are here at another poster. This is Rubens Tavora, and um, you work with the Valente Lab. Sus Susanna Valente is one of the PIs, um, and he's going to explain his poster to us now. Hey guys, how's it going? Yes, I'm Rubens. Really excited to give you a tour of my little uh, poster. Um, as you know, uh, HOPE is all about the block, lock, and stop approach. Um, and my poster really is about using two different drugs in combination in an attempt to hopefully one day reach the functional cure of HIV. Basically, the, 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 the main premise is that we want to actually use these drugs, which are transcription inhibitors, right? So they're preventing the virus from ever being able to replicate itself. Uh, and we want to use these drugs mainly in combination with art, okay? Uh, the beauty of these drugs, though, is that uh, hopefully one day, if you take them for long enough, you might be able to stop 
taking the transcription inhibitor as well as stop taking ART, and you would not have a return of viral expression. So you'd basically be functional cured at that stage. That's so you the premise. you would stay undetectable, essentially? That's exactly right. So you'd stay undetectable uh, even without taking any medication. We have some uh, proof that, that's the, that you can do that in, in, in cell culture. So you can actually use cells and we can use these drugs and show that even after you, 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 you stop uh, putting these drugs in the cells, that the cells never go back to producing uh, uh, HIV uh, uh, proteins and, and, and genes. Right now, uh, the, 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 the two drugs that we have and the drugs that I've been talking about, one of them is spirulactone. Okay. Uh, and the other one is DCA, which you may be uh, familiar with. Um, so spironolactone uh, uh, is really exciting because it's already an FDA approved drug. So, so people take it uh, for heart disease uh, and they take it for a wide range of conditions. So we know it's a very safe drug. Uh, so it's really easy for us to take that drug and actually try it in people because there's already uh, the safety and there's already the, the, all the different phases uh, of approval have already gone through. So it's very exciting. And then DCA, uh, which is another transcription inhibitor, has not undergone the FDA approval yet, but we have some really uh, uh, important data in cells and also in a mouse and, and in monkeys that show that DCA is also really, really a powerful drug uh, at stopping uh, HIV from being able to, to transcribe itself. I'm not gonna bore you with the, <laughs> with the background uh, in terms of what these drugs have done, but uh, what I will say is that the main take home message, the, the, the main point of my poster, is that if you use DCA in combination with SP, so two different uh, drugs that are both transcription inhibitors, but that do that in different ways, okay? So, so SP is going to prevent uh, the virus from start the transcription, and then DCA is going to prevent the, the, the virus from being able to keep going, okay? okay. Uh, so and to reiterate, transcription is the cell's machinery replicating itself so that it can go on and infect other cells, right? Exactly. So, so basically, the, the analogy I like to give uh, is that if you think of proteins being French toast or a food that you really like, uh, then, uh, <laughs> and you think about a recipe, right? So you, you need a recipe to make whatever food you're, you're, you're interested in, right? So if you have a, a recipe, which would be your DNA, so, so imagine your well, grandmother's home and she might make really great French toast. So uh, maybe she has her recipe book with everything that's in there. Uh, well, in that case, that's kind of like your DNA, right? It's got all the instructions to all the different recipes that you may, may ever want to know. Uh, but, you know, if you're interested in making that French toast yourself, you're not just going to take all of that, uh, you know, of that book that your grandmother holds. You're going to make a copy of that, uh, of that particular page that you're interested in. And that's what transcription is. It's basically making a copy of your DNA into uh, a paper that you can take home and make the protein, which in this case... Uh, is RNA, right? So RNA is the copy that you're taking. So when we talk about transcription, we're just basically talking about uh, the, 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 the production of RNA from DNA. That, that's, uh, that's the, I think, the best way I can uh, explain Very it. Good. So these drugs are effectively preventing the virus from doing that. They're preventing the virus from ever becoming uh, a protein, from ever becoming itself, because you're preventing the copy of the, the, the main cookbook from ever uh, being able to be produced, basically. It's like you have no pen, okay? So if you have no pen, you have no pen, so you're not gonna be able to, to then make that copy uh, to take yeah. home and then make the, your French toast, basically. Uh, but again, uh, these drugs are doing that in two different ways, which is why we think that if we use them in combination, uh, it, it's going to be uh, really great. And we already know this, right? Because when people take antiretroviral ther therapy, you're not just taking one drug, right? You're actually taking three uh, or more drugs, which are they're being used in, uh, in synchrony to, to be, be able to, 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 to reach undetectable levels of so viremia. Are you using spironolactone and SP and DCA yes. and ART? All together or just the two? So right now we're all, we're using them uh, uh, together without art. Okay. But I, I, I the way I would envision these drugs from being used in a clinic would be in combination with art. Mm. Uh, I don't think that either one of these drugs can be used without art, at least initially. Okay. okay? So they, they wouldn't be frontline therapy drugs. Okay. They would be drugs that would be given in combination with art. Again, with the caveat that if you Let's, for instance, no matter how long you take uh, uh, art, 
if you ever stop taking it, then the, the virus rebounds, right? So, yeah. Uh, but with these drugs, we have the potential that after a, a while of taking them, mm -hmm. you might be able to stop taking them and then n not have any viral reactivations. That's the difference yeah. between transcription inhibitors and the ART that's currently available. ART that we currently take, of course, does not offer a functional cure, unfortunately, whereas these drugs uh, have the potential of doing so. Okay. So does ART, that falls under like the block, you're blocking the HIV replication? And then the lock would be the spironolactone and the DCA coming in, locking it in place. Yes, yes. Well, I think you can you can also look at uh, SP and DCA as being both block and lock okay. because they are doing a good job, uh, just like art, uh, of of preventing virus from being produced. Okay. Gotcha. They're just not as good as art uh, uh, by themselves at doing that. Okay. So you kind of need art to, to help them get the job of getting you down to undetectable levels. Um, but, but you're absolutely right that they, uh, art uh, and SP and DCA, they're both going to be working in, 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 in basically together in order to reach the, the block and the lock okay. of the virus. But the, 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 the main part is the blocking, right? That's, that's what the SP and DCA are really, really important for, which is preventing that virus from ever being able to, to wake up effectively. And I won't ask you to, to explain the details of, of these charts, but can you say um, generally what your findings are in using spironolactone DCA, why you're hopeful about the potential? Yes, absolutely. So, so the main finding that we have is when we take uh, cells, and these are cells that uh, are uh, infected with a uh, with HIV, um, that if you if you keep these cells in in cell culture, meaning you keep them alive uh, in a test tube for very long, and you, you you keep them in the presence of both DCA and SP, so both drugs we've been talking about, uh, you actually reach undetectable levels of uh, of a virus, okay, that, that's exciting. So, so here we're not talking about R anymore, we're just talking about these two drugs being used in combination, mm. okay? Uh, so that's exciting that yeah. we, we can reach undetectable levels, uh, but what's even more important is that uh, you can actually remove, uh, after 324 days, so almost after a whole year yeah. of these cells being in the presence of these drugs, you can actually remove these drugs from the cells. So now the cells are just, you know, in theory, the cells should rebound, right? Like uh -huh. that's, that's what you would expect. You expect if a cell is infected with HIV and you remove the treatment, that the, that the viral levels will go back up. Yeah. But that's not what's happened, okay? So the, the combination of SP and DCA have been able to ma maintain the virus at undetectable levels. And not just that, but this is the, the real powerful thing that it's, it's really exciting and it's, it's really novel is that you can then take those cells uh, that have been without any drug treatment for 90 days and you can give HIV candy to those cells. Okay, so it's basically a candy for the HIV and say, go ahead HIV, I want you to wake up, right? Wake yeah. up. Uh, and even though you give uh, HIV candy, which uh, these are called uh, uh, latency reversal agents, you cannot wake up the, the virus. So the virus is effectively dormant uh, and it's uh, so so much asleep that you cannot wake oh, it up wow. no matter how hard you try. Again, That's... these are only in a cell culture. Crazy, uh, yeah. But it is a, a, a very, very important experiment to show that you can actually block yeah. cells into a deep latency, where basically in a deep sleep that you can't wake them up from. So I'm sure the folks at home are wondering, when when can I get a hold of that? Like, yeah. what what's next as far as like, clinical trials or where do you go from here? Yeah, so I think the, the, the first step to, to do this uh, is to go into a mouse. We know SP is safe, but we want to make sure we go through the safety uh, 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 of using both of these drugs in combination in an actual animal. Uh, and then once we, we make sure that this is working a mouse, then you might go into a non-human primate, so use a monkey. And then after the monkey, that's when you would actually go into people. Mm. That's kind of like the pathway of progression. Uh, progression. So we're, we're at the, it, it's, it's exciting. We're at the early stages of this. Uh, but again, Hope has, it's a huge collaboratory. You have a lot of, of different laboratories involved in this. So we have specialists and people that deal with mouse. We have specialists and people that deal with these non-human primates. So we have a whole team of scientists who, can, who are we're going to be working really hard to bring this to the clinic as quickly as possible, right? And the, the last comment I'll say about this is that uh, the reason why these transcription inhibitors are also really powerful, uh, with you know, if that wasn't cool enough, uh, is that people who are living with HIV, 
who are taking art uh, regularly, they will have undetectable levels of virus. That we know, right? And because they're not detectable, they can't transmit it, which is great. The problem is that uh, we're now becoming more and more aware that even though uh, they have undetectable levels of virus, they still have a chronic inflammation. So you yes. still have residual uh, ex uh, expression. So you have a little bit of, 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 vi of antigens, we call antigens, of foreign proteins being made, which causes this chronic inflammation, chronic immune activation. And I appreciate you bringing that up because that's something that we're starting to discuss in the channel and dive into. Yes. So that's all, top of mind for a lot of people. Yes, absolutely. So we're very aware of that. Uh, we're looking to ways of, of approaching that. And we think that transcription inhibitors are a, a really big way in which you can prevent that immune activation from happening, mm. right? Because if there's no, if there's no copy being made, uh, there's not going to be any protein being made. And the, yeah. immuno, the immune activation is coming from the protein. So if you stop the copy, mm. you're never going to get that activation. So people are going to be able to live longer and live healthier. Mm. Uh, because you're not going to have the, 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 the immune activation that we currently so do. So even before potentially reaching the step for a cure, it could potentially be used just to stop chronic inflammation and all the comorbidities that go along with that. Absolutely, Amazing. absolutely. So it's uh, we, we, we're in a rush to get this into a clinic and to get into people because, yes, even without a functional cure, this is already uh, a, a big deal in terms of health, uh, improving people's quality of life. Okay, thank you so much for that explanation. Yes, yes you're welcome. I didn't know half of that, so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome, my pleasure. Um, and by the way, guys, if you enjoy Ruben's talk, um, I'm considering and I'm highly likely that I'll bring him on in the future to kind of break down what HIV virus is, the different parts, and, and just make it easy for you all to understand so that we can go beyond HIV 101 and kind of begin to learn together more and more about science and research. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Thanks Appreciate so you guys. Right. <laughs> See you soon. All right, guys. So now I'm here with Quentin to explain his poster. I'll let you kick it off. Okay. So, um, oh, and you're with, you're with Hope? Yes, I'm with Hope. I'm Valente with Susanna. Susanna. Yep. Uh, Susanna excellent. Valente. Okay, great. So in my lab, we are trying to identify new proteins that are involved in the activation of transcription of HIV or in the latency uh, state of HIV. Mm -hmm. uh, so to do that, we use a technique called CHAP-MS. Basically, uh, we're trying to identify all the proteins involved in the uh, promoter of HIV. So like the parts that start the transcription of, of uh, HIV. Okay. The CHAP-MS is a process to find those proteins? Yes, exactly. Okay. So it's a combination of, of different techniques. Uh, uh, CHIP, chromatin immunoprecipitation, uh, CRISPR, Cas9, okay. and mass spectrometry. I'm sure people have heard of CRISPR. CRISPR, yeah. yeah. And the last one was? Mass spectrometry. So mass, mass spectrometry, spectrum. MS. Wow. This is an okay. uh, analytical technique that will identify the protein uh, based on the mass of the, pro the protein mm -hmm. and specifically here on the uh, HIV promoter, either on the active state of HIV or in the latent state of mm -hmm. HIV. We found proteins that we already know have been involved in these two states, but also novel factors that we had no idea they were here. Uh, mm. One of them is FUBP3. FUBP3 is... Which one? FUBP3 here. FUBP3? Yeah. Okay. So the far upstream binding protein three. Um, it's a protein that is known to bind single-stranded DNA to uh, control gene expression. So we were thinking maybe it's also controlling gene expression of HIV. Hmm. Um, so we're trying to investigate exactly. Meaning maybe either activating it or inactivating it? Exactly, and in this particular case in, in the uh, activation of HIV because it was found in the active state of HIV. Mm, gotcha. Okay. Um, so first of all, we confirm that it was indeed part of the activation of HIV. We knock down, so we remove if we of the cells and we see a decrease of the activation. Ah. So we were pretty happy of that. Yeah. And then next step, we reintroduced if we in the cells mm -hmm. and we have the risk queue. So we have an increase of HIV activation. Okay. So, so you saw a direct correlation, correlation when you took it out or when you introduced it? Exactly. And that's a protein? It's a protein, yeah. Okay. And also we found that it was required for infection because when we remove that protein uh, before infecting cells, uh, we found that we have a depletion of HIV activation 
transcription and expression. We have less uh, uh, RNA uh, mm -hmm. of HIV and we have less proteins uh, um, uh, of HIV, in mm -hmm. that case, P24. So that was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, then, now that we have confirmed kind of the role of FWP3 there, we wanted to investigate exactly how this works, how FWP3 somehow control this activation of HIV. Of, uh, yeah. HIV. So we, uh, we run an experiment called CHIP, chromatin immunoprecipitation, and we found that FWP3 is interacting. Wait, uh, can you say, say the name of the experiment again? CHIP, so chromatin immunoprecipitation. Okay. And we found that FWP3 was interacting specifically at two locations of the HIV genome. And that is a clear evidence of... The genome is the DNA of the DNA of, the of, HIV, of HIV, yeah. Of HIV. On the okay. gene of HIV. So this protein is interacting on two points on that DNA. Yes. Okay. Two close points. Two close points? Yes. Okay, is that significant that they're close? Yes. Mm. It is significant uh, because it's on the HIV promoter. So where oh. the, the, the transcription starts, mm. where the expression of HIV starts, mm -hmm. and it is a clear confirmation of first the, the screening that we have done, where we have this enrichment specifically in this location. Mm -hmm. And also we have this evidence of direct or indirect binding of the protein uh, in that part of the HIV gene. Mm. So now we, what we're trying to, to find is uh, why FWP3 is there? <laughs> what is it doing? Does it help the, the recruitment of other factors? Does it help yeah. the uh, other proteins to, to elongate the HIV transcription? We don't know yet. So that's okay. what we are trying to find in that. Basically where we are... Well, I have to say it's fascinating um, for people outside of science. The things that you're able to accomplish <laughs> and figure out, like these are things that are on microscopic level that we can't see with our own eyes. And somehow you're able to to do all these things. It's uh, it's really incredible. Thank you. <laughs> and so that's the next step. Do you have a, a plan or? Yes, we have a plan. So we are trying. So now we have like a local view of what's happening. Mm -hmm. We're trying to find uh, on the genome wide view what FWP3 is, in, is interacting with. Uh, so it, does it interact with other genes? Does it interact with other proteins? Yeah. To like find the, the, the final story, the final yeah. mechanism by which FWP3 uh, activates it. Once you understand how it works, then you might be able to manipulate that. Somehow. Exactly. Um, Maybe we can somehow uh, uh, in, in, uh, inhibit the proteins and uh -huh. uh, 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 inhibit the HIV transcription and activation. Or could you also use it to activate latent? We can. We could also words? do the. We could also do the contrary. And uh, uh, yes, that's all the, That's what all the labs are trying to do to reactivate uh, 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 latency, so mm -hmm. that they can be able to kill the cells that yeah. have this uh, HIV gene. Yep. And are you able to explain how you're able to figure out how it's interacting with other proteins? Oh uh, yes. So how we can do that is. Uh, by uh, co-IP. So immunoprecipitation, we have FWP3. We try to pull down the protein and we try to find what is binding to in terms of other, pro, pro, uh, of other proteins. And that we is can- Is that a culture? Uh, no, so that's, you have the lysate of, okay, that's gonna be, <laughs> that's gonna be, too. yes, too complicated. Okay. Uh, but are you introducing um, single proteins at a time to see if there's an interaction? Uh, no, that's going to be a mixture of the, all the proteins that we can find in okay. cells. We, we uh, add FWP3, uh -huh. we pull down, and we try to find what other proteins have been pulled down at the same time. Oh, okay. So that's basically the... Interesting. <laughs> the <laughs> okay, fascinating. That's great. Great job, and I appreciate you taking the time to explain. Yep, no problem. You did well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, folks, now I'm here with Aiden Hi. to talk about her poster. So I'll let her take over. Okay, um, so primarily, ha are you familiar with Varinostat? No. So it's an HDAC inhibitor that actually failed clinical trials because it wasn't able to do enough in terms of HIV latency reversal. Um, okay, can you explain what an HDAC inhibitor is? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so HDAC inhibitors... Um, it's the histone deacetylase inhibitors. So they allow the chromatin to be able, within your DNA, to be able to loosen. Um, so that transcription factors are allowed to get in and transcribe DNA better. Okay. Um, 
But yes, so it failed clinical trials because it wasn't able to do enough in terms of HIV latency reversal. So our, I guess, question was how can we, what can we do to enhance this process so that it can go through clinical trials in terms of HIV treatment? So, okay, let me get this clear. The HDAC inhibitor would actually encourage tran transcription. Yes, it encourages the transcription so that we can we can awaken the cells um, okay. out of their dormant state. And to remind folks uh, who are watching, HIV transcription is replication of the of, its, of the viral DNA the viral, so that it yeah. can spread, do its it viral its thing, RNA to other cells, and that's how it infects. And so the HDAC inhibitor, they they actually want want it to t start doing what the transcription. Yes. Because we can't find or attack latent reservoirs while they're, they're silent. Yes, they're hiding in your body. Yeah. So by using the HDAC inhibitors, it wakes up those we latent wake them cells up. so that we can find them and then get rid of them. Very good. Okay. <laughs> okay, so it failed clinical trials initially. It failed clinical trials. It wasn't able to do enough for latency reversal. Okay. So it didn't make it through clinical trials. Gotcha. Um, so we're trying to figure out what we can add and to just it. Just to clarify, clinical trials means um, working with humans at yes, that point? Yes, clinical okay. trials are working with humans. Gotcha, okay. Um, so, that's, so that's kind of like late stage to go to get to the point where you're actually working with humans yes. as opposed to <laughs> mice or non-human primates. Yes. That's kind of a big deal. We know it's, it's safe. Yeah, and a lot of work went into getting it there and then to fail clinical trials is so a sad. <laughs> and, so, and, I, and that's a really good point because there are, as you can see, you're just seeing a small portion of, of the researchers that are working on all this stuff and they all have their own experiments, they have their own clinical trials, and it's, it's, I'm sure it's like really uh, disappointing when things don't pan out the way that you hope. Unfortunately, 99% of research is failure, but it's learning from those failures that's the most important part of yeah. trying to move forward. And how do you, do you, do you get trained at all on how to build that resiliency in yourself, at, like professionally, to like be able to withstand the constant failure, 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 and know that that's just part of the process? Honestly, since I, I am so new to the research world, I just finished my, my bachelor's degree in May, and so I Amazing. Am Congratulations. <laughs> I have been thrown into it, and it's definitely, I feel like it's going to be tough at first getting used to the amount of failure that is going to be experienced. Do you get emotionally involved yes. at first? I mean, it's your work. That's yeah. your baby that you've spent so much months and so much work preparing for, and then, but it's part of the process and you know just being able to you know if something fails it's what's the next step how can we work past it what can yeah. we do to get it to move forward exactly etc great okay so we use we tried to repurpose a treatment that actually was fda approved for ovarian tumors um and they for treating ovarian tumors they used hdac inhibitors in combination with parp inhibitors um which are the poly adp ribose polymerase okay super family of enzymes and that was able to successfully treat ovarian tumors. So we wanted to be able to repurpose that and try to put that into increasing our um, efficacy does, for does latency. Does also work with the transcription? It also encourages that in Parp addition? Inhibitors? Yes. Um, okay. The specific enzyme, there's 14 enzymes within the PARP family, and we focused on tankerase um, for our project. Okay. And we hypothesized that it was these two different pathways that would be able to work for our kick and kill method that we are trying to utilize. Are you familiar with kick and kill method? Is that um, is that similar to shock and kill? Yes, it's it's basically the renamed version of shock and oh, kill. Oh, it is. Oh, okay. Same thing. But kick okay. and kill sounds better. Because we talked about shock and kill in my <laughs> weekly HIV news videos, so some of you who will follow my content will be familiar with shock and kill. <laughs> Do you want me to say shock and kill instead? Would that be no, easier? Kick and kill. Okay. It's a new, it's a new <laughs> term. Kick and kill 2.0. Yeah. Um, so the combination of the HDAC inhibitors and the PARP inhibitors worked on treating ovarian tumors. We wanted to see if we could utilize both of those to treat HIV tumors or HIV cells as yeah. well. And we did this by we tested three different kinds of cell lines. Cell lines aren't human primary cells, um, which is kind of our next step is to try to recreate all this research in human primary cells. But we used JLAT cell lines um, and we treated them with the HDAC inhibitors as well as the PARP inhibitors and then measured them with a flow cytometer to see if they had fluoresce. So our JLAT cells, when they are latent, um, don't express any of the green fluorescence proteins. It's less than 1%. Um, that they do express. Yeah. And so after treated with our HDAC inhibitors and our PARP inhibitors, if successful, they would have reactivated and would fluoresce. So when you look under a microscope, you actually see fluorescent light? Flow cytometer. Oh, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> so we use a flow cytometer to measure the fluorescence. Gotcha. Um, and this the fluorescence means that it's activated? Yes, it means that we've successfully activated those latent cells. Okay. Um, by the 
and we measured that thing. by the expression. Yes, that's a good yeah, thing. In this case. <laughs> um, and so we actually found the PARP inhibitors alone weren't able to do anything in terms of latency reversal, but in combination with our HDAC inhibitors, we saw three to four fold increase mm. in latency reversal efficacy, um, which is very successful. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically and so what's what we next? did. Uh, to create this into human primary cells, since okay. we just used the cell lines. That's right. Um, it's, you know, it's good to get a basic sense of working with cell lines, but it's the important part is to be able to recreate that in human primary cells. And then you kind of take the next steps. You can do mice, you can do non-human primates, et cetera. Uh, progression to human clinical exactly. trials. <laughs> so this is just, this is the base of all of those steps of research. Yes. And also we mainly focused on the latency reversal aspect of the kick and kill method. And mm -hmm. so our next steps would also include focusing more on the kill method. And how can we get those immune cells stimulated more to be able to, you know, kill those cells that we've now, you know, brought out of their latent form? Excellent. Amazing. Thank well, you. Folks, thank you so much. Thank you. This is the new face of uh, Futures HIV Science. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> we'll get there someday, maybe. Awesome. Well, you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, everyone. So now I'm with Andrew to talk about his poster. Take it away. So, hey, everyone. So my poster uh, mainly focuses on the use of spironolactone uh, and its effect that it can have in a non-human primate model um, with, an, or with HIV infection as well. So originally we decided to look at spironolactone because um, it was found that it specifically degrades XPB, which is a subunit of a complex that's very important for initiation of HIV transcription. Okay, so, so SPV, can you um, break that down? What <laughs> SPV, what's SPV? So, so it's SP is oh. short for spironolactone. But then so. you said something else. SPV is a something. Oh, X XPV. XPV. Oh, okay, yeah. what's XPV? So XPV, it's a subunit of a complex that's important for what's initiation. A so <laughs> it's like, uh, think of it like a bunch of proteins that work together. Okay. So and then basically their job is to start transcribing DNA. So okay. it can yeah, basically So complexes are, are groupings of proteins. Yes. And they serve different functions within a cell. Yes. And this particular correct. complex, XPB, initiates HIV or yeah, HIV transcription. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which is like we've been repeating multiple times, is uh, how HIV replicates itself. It's like the machinery. Yes. That's okay. Correct. Great. Um, and we've heard about spironolactone with uh, Rubens as well. So mm -hmm. that's great. We're starting to hear the same uh, terms more than once. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'll let you take it away. All right, great. So yeah, that's kind of the background of what SP is. Okay. And so basically, originally we were using it in a cell model to look at how it can affect HIV transcription. And we saw that when SP was used in combination with antiretroviral therapy, we could drop HIV almost below the limit of detection compared to ART alone. So, and this was very promising for us. Mm. And then going off of that, we also looked a little bit deeper and saw that spironolactone specifically affects uh, viral transcripts, so HIV transcripts, uh, in compared to cellular transcripts, which basically means that the drug is specific for targeting HIV transcription. Gotcha, okay, following along. Great. <laughs> so then, so that was the cell line model. So then we decided to move. And this was all working yeah. with Non-human primates? So this side was cell line. So this oh, was, this was, yeah. Okay, so this is separated. Okay, yeah. this is all cell line in a yeah. culture. Yeah, in a culture. Yeah. Got it. So then um, basically we went from that and then it turned over into what I did for this project, which was going into the non-human primate model. And basically this, we set up a schedule where we wanted to test whether or not spironolactone could have the same effect in the non-human primate model as it did in the cell culture model. Great. So we set up a model where every two weeks, uh, the monkeys would have an escalating dose of SP mm -hmm. uh, up to 48 milligrams per kilogram, which is a very high dose. So we were expecting that at that high dose, we would see um, degradation of XPB almost to zero. So that was the goal for this, was to see how far we could degrade XPB. And the more you degrade XPB, the less HIV replication is happening, or transcription. Yeah, and that's, that's what we're hoping to see. That's the so, goal, okay, yes. great. So if you look here, so in the results, we see that by the 24 milligram per kilogram uh, dose, the levels of XPB were reduced by greater than 50%. So you can see com comparing the black to the uh, red. Okay. So 
which is very promising. That's what we wanted to see. Oh, I see. So that's what we're looking at. Yeah. The so initial, like, and then with yeah, the SP. and then the SP, and then gotcha. we did that for four animals. Okay. So, yep. And then if you want to look at it in the, the graph form, so this is all different concentrations, all the way to forty-eight milligram per kilogram, and you can see at the forty-eight milligram per kilogram time point, oh, it wow. was basically completely gone. Okay. So you're really seeing the progression as more SP is introduced. The XPB expression is that what's or no? XPB, so the protein level, yeah. Protein level yeah. is so it'll be decreased dramatically. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's basically what we wanted to see. Uh, cool. This initial non-human primate model was used as kind of a pilot study to make sure that that spironolact spironolactone did have this effect uh -huh. in the non-human primates. And so now the next step would be to use this in an infection model, so we can. It's an infection model. So basically, an infection model is we take the same model that we did with the non-human primate models, and it just also happens to be infected with either SIV or SHIV. So simian immunodeficiency virus uh -huh. or simian human immunodeficiency virus. Wait, what's the, <laughs> wait, because I've heard both of those terms. So what's mm -hmm. the difference between SIV and HIV? So SIV is a specific virus to non-human primates. Uh -huh. So as HIV is a hybrid, hybridized oh. virus. So it actually... Is that done in the lab or is that yes. naturally it's occurring? Not naturally occurring. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, it's a lab-made virus and it actually, um, it gives a better idea of how the interaction between, say, like SP, for example, would occur in a human... Okay, so yeah. maybe if you're still worrying, ab worrying about safety, mm -hmm. then that's an opportunity where you can... You may, you've made this hybrid so you can potentially see in a non-human primate how it might affect yeah a human in a human that's without correct. actually putting it in a human right away yes okay yeah so it Very gives cool. us a better general I learned idea something so but yeah so that's the status of the work that i've done so far um it was also important to note that um we wanted to see to make sure the monkeys could tolerate the drug well yeah and so they how, all how did that turn out they did they, they were all very happy no negative side effects and they, all the blood biochemistry that we did so uh -huh. you know standard you know potassium sodium cbc's all that type okay. of stuff all fell within reference ranges so they were very happy so and so you said the next step is to use shiv yeah either shiv or siv or so SIV. It's still a, yeah decision that we're making okay so. And then we can see if... The, okay, so these non-human primates didn't have either. Yeah, so these were otherwise not, healthy. not infected. That's correct. Okay, gotcha. Yep. Very cool. Thank you for explaining that. You made it seem so easy, even though I'm sure this is way more complicated <laughs> than it sounds. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. I'm with Bill right now, and he's going to explain one of these posters to us today. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Um, our poster is about a series of partner protections that together community members, along with principal investigators and clinicians, have put together to ensure the safe and successful um, duration of a, of, a, uh, of a clinical study that involves a, an ATI, or analytical treatment interruption, which means that people who are HIV positive have to stop taking their meds or their, their life-saving HIV medication in order to have the, to figure out if the actual um, experimental drug is gonna be successful. And giving up um, taking your and meds. To, sorry to interrupt you, yeah. but yes. for those of you who want more information on ATIs, clinical studies, um, I actually did an interview okay. with Tom Villa recently. It's, on, it's live on my YouTube. I'll put a card up here so you can watch that. If you want a little background, a little refresher on, on what Bill's going to cover. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Okay. So um, I was just going to say that, you know, um, for me, I've been positive for over 30 years, and I kind of grew up in the, you know, when it became U equals U, and we no longer had it disclosed, you weren't um, worried because, you know, I was, I was on my meds, I was undetectable, I couldn't transmit. On these studies, you're going off your meds and you are able to tra potentially transmit. And that's a huge thing for your sexual partners. And I think that, you know, we're already asking a lot of people mm -hmm. to go on a study. It's very time consuming. Um, it affects you, it affects your life partners, it affects your family. Um, Especially for those of us in a seropolarized relationship yes. where one person is negative and one person is living with HIV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. my husband is, is, is not positive. Okay. And he was actually um, very concerned with me going on the study. Um, I thought it was important because I'm only here as a result of the people who did the Crixivan studies back in, in the early 90s that, you know, I went from AZT to Crixivan and that was a huge thing. So yeah. um, we think that it's, a, you know, we have set up some, some basic partner protections that we would like to see as part of all clinical studies that, that okay. involve an ATI. And, you know, it involves things like the proper site selection, 
you know, a robust community relationship, you know, the ability to make referrals. I mean, it, you know, it's one thing to say, get on prep or have your sex partners get on prep. It's yeah. another thing to be able to say, here's how you get on yeah. prep. Here's where you go. So I think that, that um, that's kind of what we're trying to do. We're putting together a toolkit uh -huh. that would be available to people um, to the, to, you know, part like part of the informed consent that yeah. you actually work through and, and there's checklists. I mean, people don't know how to disclose anymore. You've got to disclose, not only you've got to disclose that you're HIV positive, you've got to disclose that you're now potentially viremic, you've got to disclose that you're on a study. Some people don't understand and you have to explain all of those things. So that's why we have put this together. I think it's very important. You know, we've got to, you know, it will ensure the scientific and social value of an ATI. You know, it reduces the likelihood of unintended transmission, and should there be transmission, ensure a prompt management of any acquired HIV uh, infection. And so you brought this here specifically so that the science community can see this? Yes. I think as well as community members yeah, like Community myself. members, but it's also, you know, we have been trying to reach out to the scientific community because it's got to be uh, adopted by everyone. The community wants this. We talk about it mm -hmm. at, at a community level, yeah. how important that, it, that this is. We have got to get the investigators. You know, it's got to be built into the design of studies that, that um, you're, again, I, I can't get over how much we're asking people mm -hmm. to, to, to give up and to, um, to risk by going on these studies. We've got to make it really easy and beneficial. Yeah. And I think having, having partner protections as a part of the, the, the entire package would be very helpful. Excellent. Thank you so much, um, Steve. My pleasure. Explainer. Thank you for A huge thank you to these wonderfully generous and patient investigators and community advocate Alina Peng, Rubens Tavora, Quentin Jabot, Aidan McGraw, Andrew McCauley, and Bill Freshwater. Thank you all so much for allowing me to commandeer your poster session without any warning. Um, if you did not understand everything that was discussed by our investigators, I hope you learned something and are starting to pick up on maybe a word here or a word there that you didn't know be before, like maybe HIV transcription. Maybe now you know what HIV transcription is, or if you've never heard of spironolactone and the way that it's used in HIV care research, now maybe you know, things like that. Um, the goal is definitely not that you walk away from this understanding everything that's going on, but that you just start to like challenge yourself a little bit and be able to engage more with the science in HIV research. If you'd like to see more poster session videos like this one, hopefully next time with better video and audio, let me know in the comments below. Until next time, cheers. Bye.